Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. On Sunday, April 10th, French voters cast their ballots in the first round of the presidential election. There were many candidates on the ballot, and without any single candidate securing more than 50% of the vote, the top two finishers face off in a runoff election on April 24th. And those two will be President Emmanuel Macron, who finished with 27.6% of the vote, and the far right wing politician Marine Le Pen, who finished with 23%. Macron and Le Pen faced each other in 2017, and back then Macron absolutely trounced her, defeating Le Pen by more than 30 points. But this time around, the vote promises to be much closer, with many polls putting Le Pen within striking distance of Macron. On the line with me to explain what happened in this first round and what to expect ahead of the final vote on April 24th is Art Goldhammer. He is a writer and translator of over 125 books from French to English and a senior affiliate at the Center for European Studies at Harvard. We kick off discussing the results of the first round before having a longer conversation about the implications of the fact that the far right-wing candidate Le Pen is surging in the polls. This is a great conversation. We recorded it live using Twitter Spaces, and Art Goldhammer took some time to take questions from the audience after I finished my Q&A. If you'd ever like to participate in one of these live tapings of the podcast, simply follow me on Twitter at Mark L. Goldberg. All right, now here is my conversation with Art Goldhammer. First of all, it has to be said that Marine Le Pen has uh, steadily increased her party's uh, share of the vote since she took over the party from her father in uh, 2011. In addition, uh, anxiety in France over uh, terrorism, over immigration, over the rising cost of living, all those things have been increasing over the past uh, several years. And uh, Le Pen has capitalized on those anxieties. Uh, She's also softened the image of the party, changing it from uh, the image created by her father of uh, a reactionary, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, racist party. She retains all those qualities, but in a sotto voce manner, whereas uh, her father was very in your face about all of that. Uh, She decided that the way to win a larger share of the vote was to uh, de-demonize the party, as the French like to say. So she's put a smiling face on it. She's often photographed with her cats. She has quite a few of them. She has a much softer manner than her father. She surrounded herself uh, with advisors who uh, also project a softer image. The current, uh, she appointed recently as uh, head of the party, Uh, A young man still in his 20s, uh, Jordan Bardella, who is well-spoken and clean-cut and does not have any of the uh, ex-paratrooper Algerian torture image that uh, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen liked to uh, project. So she's made her party uh, more respectable. And with that respectability has come substantial support from the working class. She's now the largest working class party in France. She's appealed to the working class, expanded the appeal of the appeal of her party, and and cast herself as the primary opposition to uh, what many people in France see as uh, a ruthless uh, neoliberal reform carried out by Macron. To what extent does Macron have himself to blame for this apparent, you know, surge in support for Marine Le Pen? Well, there's no doubt that uh, Macron is a a neoliberal. Uh, He's uh, enacted uh, a number of reforms, including abolishing the wealth tax, uh, structural reforms of the labor market, uh, tax incentives uh, favorable to business uh, since he's come into office. He promised to do all those things when he ran in 2017. 
uh, and he's done them. That was essentially the uh, program of the center-right party, the uh, descendant of the Gaullists, uh, which now calls itself uh, Les Républicains. And uh, he essentially occupied their space, although in 2017 he ran as uh, uh, what I would call an unidentified political object. He claimed to be uh, neither the right nor the left, and his favorite slogan was that he would make, uh, uh, at the same time, reforms of both the right and the left. He's carried through with the right-wing uh, part of that program, but uh, fell short on the, the left-wing part. Although, in fairness to Macron, it has to be said that uh, the overall effect of his uh, tax reforms was uh, uh, some uh, increased redistribution to the center of the income uh, 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 of the income distribution. Uh, the top 20 percent uh, earns or, or uh, pays slightly more in taxes, and the middle 60 percent pays slightly less in taxes uh, than before Macron. Uh, but the top 1 percent did uh, receive the uh, largest uh, boost in income from the tax reforms, uh, and that earned him the uh, epithet president of the rich. Uh, so that has more or less shaped his image, and uh, in that sense, he is responsible for the uh, uh, difficulty in which he finds himself right now. So is it fair to say that five years ago, to a large degree, Macron was able to you know, surge to victory because he was kind of an unknown political entity and people sort of projected themselves and their uh, ideas of what he might be onto him, even though he didn't have much of a record to run on and, and sort of that his the fact that he was, as you said, like an unknown political object was part of, of the reason that he was able to win so handily last time around. Yes, that that's part of it. Uh, it was also the uh, abject failure of François Hollande's presidency. Hollande finished with a popularity and, and approval rating of about 5%. Uh, so uh, he, he was uh, in such bad shape with the voters that he couldn't even uh, run uh, to succeed himself. Uh, Macron had uh, risen under Hollande, but he had also previously served President Sarkozy. So the fact that he had worked for both sides, uh, both mainstream parties, uh, before coming to, uh, before running for office himself, uh, gave him credibility as someone who uh, was either in both camps or in either camp, uh, depending on which way you want to look at it. So, uh, yes, he, he uh, uh, was a, a, a novelty on the political scene. Uh, it also has to be said that he brought a tremendous amount of energy to his campaign in 2017. Uh, he was young and uh, good-looking and uh, a new kid on the block. Uh, he didn't carry any particular political baggage with him, although he had been responsible for some unpopular uh, reforms under Hollande. Uh, those were forgiven him because he uh, had turned his back on Hollande, uh, so he looked like uh, an opponent rather than uh, uh, an opponent of Hollande, rather than a proponent of some of his most uh, popular, unpopular reforms. So all that worked in his favor. Uh, that energy has disappeared from his campaign this year because he's been uh, distracted by the war in Ukraine. To his credit, he uh, sought to head off that war, uh, traveled to Russia to meet with Putin. Uh, the effort was ultimately a failure. Uh, but he has been deeply involved in uh, trying to uh, bring that war to an end or to, in the meantime, to coordinate European support for Ukraine. Uh, and hence hasn't, uh, to this point, campaigned very hard, whereas uh, Le Pen uh, and uh, uh, another far-right opponent, Eric Zemmour, uh, had uh, been the, the real sources of energy in this campaign to date. That will probably change from this point out. Uh, Macron will be uh, quite active over the next two weeks uh, in campaigning for his re-election. So Marine Le Pen, internationally at least, is known for her racism and, and, and xenophobia. To what extent did racism and xenophobia serve as an animating force in this election just yesterday? I mean, as I take it, as, as you've said, and as I've read from other analysis of the election, she sought to, to sort of soften that image. Um, 
but was there still that sort of xenophobic undercurrent to both her message and messages of, of other candidates in this election? Yes, there was. Uh, she's in the fortunate position now of having uh, the xenophobia and racist as uh, sort of the underlying brand of her party. So she no longer has to advertise those aspects. Uh, people know that uh, she stands for those things, and occasionally she reminds them of it. Uh, she has proposed uh, a national preference amendment to the Constitution so that uh, natural-born French citizens will have uh, uh, certain advantages uh, constitutionally guaranteed if she's elected. So that was a reminder of her uh, racist beginnings. But she was also helped in this campaign by the uh, presence of uh, Eric Zemmour, uh, who uh, uh, ha has uh, taken it upon himself to represent the uh, real hardcore of French uh, racism and uh, xenophobia. In fact, uh, He's such a racist that he's been convicted in court three times for incitement uh, of racial hatred. Uh, when uh, Zemmour first appeared on the scene, it looked like he was going to break uh, uh, Le Pen's momentum. Polls had ranked her, had rated her as high as 30 to 35 percent against Macron's uh, 25 or so uh, before the campaign began. But th then Zemmour got into the race and immediately took half of Marine Le Pen's uh, base from her. Uh, he was he hit a high watermark of about 17 percent of the polls and for a week or so was even leading Le Pen. Uh, and uh, he, uh, by contrast to his uh, hardcore racist positions, uh, Le Pen uh, came to look uh, uh, almost moderate. So uh, his advent in the race uh, uh, helped her eventually. Now, his initially good showing was uh, undermined when uh, the war in Ukraine broke out because he had been an outspoken uh, supporter of Putin and of Russia, and he remained so even uh, after the war and despite the atrocities. Le Pen uh, has uh, changed her tune on, on Putin. She has been a supporter of Putin in the past. She went to Russia and was photographed with him. That photograph appeared in some of her campaign leaflets. Uh, but once the war broke out, she uh, uh, welcomed uh, Ukrainian refugees to France, uh, unlike other refugees whom she rejects. Uh, uh, Zemmour did not do that. Uh, and she condemned uh, Russian atrocities, which uh, Zemmour also uh, declined to do. So that uh, shifted her relative positioning and undermined Zemmour, who finished with only 7% uh, yesterday, uh, compared with the 17 or 18% that he had been uh, 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 polling uh, earlier on. Uh, so, so that sort of gets to my next question. To what extent did the war in Ukraine rank highly on how and why, perhaps in exit polls, if, if there are such, on, on how that may have influenced French voters one way or another? Uh, I haven't seen any exit polling on, on the matter, but uh, French, uh, 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 across the political spectrum in France, there's great concern about the war in Ukraine and its uh, implications for Europe. Uh, the aspect of the Ukraine war that uh, Le Pen emphasized was uh, the way it's uh, affected the cost of living in Europe. Uh, purchasing power has been one of her main campaign themes uh, throughout this campaign. Uh, fuel prices have gone up dramatically in Europe, even more than uh, in the United States. There's been uh, some effort to subsidize fuel costs uh, for French consumers uh, but not enough to offset the increase in fuel costs. Uh, so uh, Le Pen was able to uh, 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 stress the uh, increase in our cost of living and to say that it was unfair for uh, the, the, that though she condemned the, the uh, Russian invasion, it was unfair for French consumers to have to bear the, uh, the cost of, uh, of fighting the war. You know, we are facing you know a not insignificant prospect that Marine Le Pen is the next uh, president of of France. I know we'll we'll talk to this in a bit, but I know polling right now certainly favors Macron. Uh, but 
there is, you know, of course, a not insignificant chance that Marine Le Pen could become the next president. What do we know about her foreign policy preferences? Has she spoken on the campaign trail about, you know, how she might change France's relationship with the world, which has, you know, remained fairly consistent over the last several decades? Um. Yes, she has uh, spoken uh, quite a bit about her foreign policy preferences. Uh, It's well known that she's hostile to the EU. In her 2017 campaign, she had even proposed a French exit from the EU, Frexit, but she later backed off that proposal. Uh, She has called for France to withdraw from NATO and uh, maintains that call uh, despite uh, the importance of NATO in confronting Russia now. Uh, She has said that her policy preference is for France to maintain a policy, a foreign policy equidistant from the United States and Russia. And she uh, places that position in a direct line from uh, Charles de Gaulle, who, of course, saw himself as uh, 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 advocating an independent French foreign policy during the Cold War. Uh, so uh, she remains consistent on those themes, uh, has uh, really not varied since she took over the party uh, in 2011. I don't like know the powers of the French presidency, but if she were to be president, she could, could she say withdraw or remove France from NATO or take moves to uh, towards a, a sort of you know soft Frexit position unilaterally as president? Well, uh, there are some things she can do unilaterally, laterally, other things where she needs ratification from the uh, uh, National Assembly and uh, others where uh, there will be uh, contestation from the EU level about what precisely she has the right to do. Now, it's interesting that uh, after Poland said that uh, it did not recognize the supremacy of EU law or the uh, right of the uh, European Court of Justice to uh, uh, make decisions regarding uh, internal Polish affairs, Uh, a number of French politicians said they agreed with that position. And they held that the French constitution was uh, took uh, uh, primacy over uh, EU treaties. Uh, not only uh, Marine Le Pen, but also the candidate of the center-right party, Valérie Pécresse, and her opponents in the center-right primary all uh, took that position, including uh, Michel Barnier, who was the EU negotiator in Brexit, which was a rather astonishing thing. So there's a a fair amount of support in France for the idea that uh, French law takes precedence over uh, European law, no matter what the European Union thinks. So there would be a fight uh, uh, over some of these issues. Now, Marine Le Pen has said that uh, if she comes to power, she will immediately place uh, new border controls around France's borders at all the border crossing points, not only to keep uh, illegal immigrants out, but also to uh, uh, tighten checks on goods flowing into France. Uh, That is a clear violation of European treaties and would be a threat to the European single market. So there would certainly be strong pushback on that from uh, many of France's European partners, uh, but also some support from uh, uh, dissidents within the EU, such as uh, Hungary's Orban, who was also uh, who was reelected uh, last weekend. What impact do you foresee would the election of Marine Le Pen have outside of France in the domestic politics of places, I don't know, like Germany or Italy or uh, other key countries within the European Union? If well, any- it, it would cause consternation in Germany and Italy, uh, certainly. Uh, There would be, uh, I predict, uh, a a massive crash in the European stock market. The bond spread on French bonds uh, uh, compared to the German Bund would uh, widen. Uh, There would be panic in many other European capitals. There is a strong potential for violence in France itself if Marine Le Pen is elected. Uh, And for uh, triggering instability uh, and... uh, uh, right-wing protests uh, throughout Europe. So uh, uh, there would be great concern. Uh, and I think uh, 
potentially dramatic consequences if Le Pen is elected, uh, not to mention the uh, effect in the United States. I mean, her election would uh, be a cause for rejoicing on the part of uh, Donald Trump and Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon met with Le Pen uh, in uh, 2017 and uh, extolled her as a potential European leader uh, of the kind that he would like to see come to power in Europe. Uh, Orban is a close friend of hers, and uh, she would, uh, uh, he would undoubtedly support her election. Uh, so we'd see uh, consequences ripple across Europe. Beyond the, the confines of Europe, it, it's hard to say. I don't know uh, how conscious uh, the rest of the world is of what's going on, although I've done interviews recently with uh, uh, TV in Australia, and I'll be on South Korean TV tonight to talk about the French election. So they are paying attention. We don't know what will happen on April 24th, but obviously, you know, right now, I should say, the polls favor slightly or more than slightly uh, Emmanuel Macron. Um, it seems to me, uh, and I'm curious to get your take on this, that what the voters uh, for the third candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, decide who they decide to back may swing this election. He was the more left-wing candidate who came in third. What do you see happening uh, among the sort of majority of voters for Mélenchon? Uh, well, that is the most important question to ask about this election. Well, that's uh, why I'm Mélen asking you. Yeah, M Mélenchon did uh, uh, better than expected. Uh, he was uh, close to uh, uh, tying Le Pen. Uh, for a moment last night, it, he had come within uh, 0 0.8 uh, percentage points of Le Pen's score. Uh, in 2017, he had been allied with uh, the Communist Party, uh, and if you add his vote to the, the this year, the communists ran their own candidate uh, who got uh, two and a half percent of the vote. If you add that two and a half percent to Mélenchon's score, uh, he could have beaten Le Pen, all other things being equal. Uh, and that would have changed the complexion of the race entirely. Uh, in 2017, uh, Mélenchon refused uh, to uh, endorse Macron and said nothing about uh, not voting for Le Pen, although uh, it was obvious to anyone who knew Mélenchon's political past that uh, he was no friend of Le Pen. And at that time, 11% of his voters, if I recall correctly, did vote for Le Pen, uh, while some 50% uh, uh, abstained and the rest went for Macron. This year, because he was so heavily criticized for not taking a a stand on on what to do in the second round. Uh, he made it very clear yesterday in his uh, very eloquent uh, uh, concession speech uh, that he did not want his supporters to vote for um, Le Pen. He said, uh, there's no doubt about the person for whom we are not going to vote, uh, and uh, you must not vote for Le Pen. Despite that, there was an instant poll conducted last night, which found that 30% uh, of his voters are intending to vote for uh, Le Pen, 34% uh, for Macron, and the remainder either undecided or uh, uh, already decided to abstain. So uh, uh, that uh, how that breaks down will de probably determine the outcome of the election. Uh, Le Pen will get the bulk of uh, Zemmour's uh, vote uh, of his 7%. The same poll found that about 85% of Z Zemmour's voters were already committed to voting for Le Pen. So Macron needs to do better than even uh, on the break uh, in the Le Pen vote uh, in order to win. At the moment, polls have him winning by any anywhere from 54 to 46 to 51 to 49 uh, 54 to 46 is a comfortable margin, but 51 to 49, not so much. Uh, and we know from uh, the uh, predictions of the Brexit vote and the Trump-Hillary vote that uh, the polls can be wrong. And uh, there's a significant uh, statistical chance that uh, uh, Le Pen could come out on top. So in the next you know, two weeks ahead of the April 24th vote, is there anything in particular that you'll be looking towards that will suggest to you how this election might 
proceed? Are there any key inflection points or key moments or key data points that you'll be looking towards to suggest to you what might happen in the second round? Uh, well, the most important thing that I will be watching is the debate. There is traditionally a debate between the two rounds of the election. In 2017, in the debate between Macron and Le Pen, uh, Macron uh, demolished Le Pen, it's fair to say. Uh, she became confused about her own proposal to uh, uh, create a substitute for the euro. At first, she had proposed uh, dumping the euro entirely, but that position proved unpopular. So <clears throat> she had a fallback proposal to introduce an alternative uh, currency called the AQ, uh, which had existed for a time before the euro came into effect. And uh, there was going to be a complicated uh, dual currency in Europe. Uh, this uh, position had been foisted upon her by one of her advisors, uh, and she didn't understand it herself. So she got into a terrible muddle and debate, and uh, Macron made mincemeat of her. Uh, he's a very uh, intelligent uh, uh, debater who masters all of the issues in minute detail. Uh, his great weakness, however, is his inability to control his arrogance. He uh, comes off as uh, Somebody who has always been the smartest kid in the class and knows it, and uh, he's uh, he he doesn't restrain himself from showing that he knows how smart he is. That doesn't play well to the voters. And arrogance is the adjective you hear most uh, frequently when you ask voters what they think about uh, uh, Macron. So it's possible that on optics, and optics always matter more in presidential debates than uh, mastery of the issues. On optics, Le Pen could win this time. Uh, she's learned how to uh, control herself on uh, on the TV platform, uh, and she'll probably um, uh, try to uh, uh, continue her uh, attempt to moderate her image and come off as someone who's uh, uh, moderate and uh, uh, not someone uh, one has to be afraid of. So the debate will be tremendously important. The other thing I'll be looking for is the way uh, Macron campaigns over the next two weeks. Uh, uh, Thomas Piketty wrote an article in uh, Le Monde this Saturday saying that Macron needed to make a strong social gesture to hand some token to the left of uh, what he would do to make good on the promises he made in 2017 that he failed to carry through on during his uh, five years in office. Uh, what social program, what uh, uh, mollification uh, uh, of the uh, the consequences of his uh, neoliberal reforms will he offer to voters on the left? Uh, it's possible that he will do that. It's also possible that he will stick to his guns. Uh, because he wants a mandate to carry through uh, a number of reforms, including the always controversial attempt to uh, raise the retirement age in France, which is one of the uh, things he's promising to do in his uh, in his next term if he's reelected. So those are those are the main things I'll be looking for. Uh, well, Art, thank you so much for your time. This was very helpful. Uh, my pleasure. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Art Goldhammer for his insights. I always appreciate learning all things French politics from him. And as always, you can reach out to me if you have suggestions of people you'd like me to interview or topics you'd like me to cover. You can hit me up on Twitter at Mark L. Goldberg or use the contact button on globaldispatches.org. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Bye.